Pastor Keith Moore, Miracles Now, Lesson 10, Yielding. If you brought your Bibles this evening, turn with me please to Mark chapter 16, last chapter of Mark. I would ask you to believe with me this evening for utterance. Let's believe together for the Lord to speak and to move and, and to work. You know, we, we get what we expect. We don't expect much. We don't get much. <laughs> but uh, let's stir our expectation up. How many believe the Lord has good things he would do for us in this time and in this year? Yes, do we need to know how to think, yes. how to talk, yes. and what to do to be in line with his perfect will and his perfect plan? In uh, Mark chapter 16, verse uh, 15, familiar passage of scripture to many. He said to them, Go, <laughs> go ye into all the world and preach, proclaim the gospel, the good news, to every creature, every creation. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And these signs, shall follow them that believe. Signs. In my name they'll cast out devils. Are they, is there such a thing as devils? Demons? Yeah, they are. But the child of God has no need to be afraid of them. Because uh, they don't have authority over us. We have authority over them. They'll speak with new tongues. That's not talking about they'll quit cussing. Use better language. Talk in a better way. No, no. This, you interpret scripture with other scripture. And in the book of Acts, repeated places, and in Corinthians and other places, uh, speaking in a new tongue meant speaking in a language you never learned. Supernaturally given utterance. And I know a lot of folks don't believe in that today, but uh, it's people who changed, not the word. And it is for everybody. And uh, if people knew how wonderful it, it was, they sure wouldn't fight it anymore. They'd be seeing how to receive. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it'll not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick. They'll recover. Is he talking about supernatural things happening? Miraculous things, not uh, explainable by natural mind and, and observation. Miraculous. He is. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat on the right hand of God. Do you believe it? Is he there tonight? The Bible said he, he ever lives to make intercession for, for you and me. He acknowledges us and uh, stands for us at the throne. Thank you, Lord. Verse 20, and so they did what he told them to do. He said, go, and so they went. And he's told them to preach everywhere, and so they preached everywhere. And he did not... Leave them alone by theirself. He worked with and confirmed the word that they were preaching, not just with intellectual stimuli, but with signs. <laughs> signs following. Hallelujah. So we've been on a series for some weeks now called Miracles Now. Miracles Now. Do you believe in miracles? A lot of people don't. Even a lot of church going people. 
But you, you can't be a Christian and not believe in miracles. You just can't. I mean, being a Christian means having faith in Jesus, the Christ. Well, the Bible said he was born of a virgin. Miracle. Right? The Bible said he, the Spirit of God came on him. And he, he went out and, and preached in the power of the Spirit and, 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 and delivered people and were out of their mind and crazy and raised people from the dead and, and people were healed and delivered and walked on the water and spoke to the winds and the waves. Somebody say miracles, miracles, miracles. And that he was crucified and did die and laid in the tomb, dead, his body in the dead in the tomb dead for, for days and nights, but was raised from the dead. Miracle. Miracle. Now you have some so-called Christians that say, well, you know, some of our most learned uh, theologians have come to the conclusion that, you know, that's more figurative and and symbolic, and, and that, that's, it's really not the most important thing. The most important thing is, is what Jesus taught and the principles that he taught. Well, he taught miracles. <laughs> he taught a new birth. He taught prayer and answered prayer and living in the power of the Spirit and signs and wonders. No, it makes all the difference. How many would say tonight, I believe in miracles? If you believe in the new birth, you have to believe it's a miracle. And of course, if you can believe that God can recreate a human spirit, why couldn't he heal a body that's already there? Why couldn't he touch a mind? Why couldn't he help you get your bills paid? Hmm? In ways that you couldn't explain. Don't you think it's amazing? Peter needed to pay some taxes and he says... Well, let's go over there and drop your line. First fish that comes up, check his mouth. <laughs> now, those people don't even believe that. They go, wow, well, you know, probably the fish stands for something. And that it was, you know, it's not a literal physical fish, you know. It's, 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 it's a teaching. No, it was a fish. And he had money in his mouth. <laughs> I was like, why do you get so animated? It irritates me for people to call the Lord a liar and, and call the word untrue. Amen. This is no small thing. And, and people that, that think like that and, and, and discount all the miracles, they're lost. They're not saved. They're not Christians. Oh, Brother Keith, no, you can't be. You must be born again. That's a miracle. And that a miracle is not going to occur unless you believe that Jesus is the Christ and he's been raised from the dead. A miracle. Somebody said out loud, I believe, I believe in, miracles. in miracles. Hallelujah. Thank you, Master. Well, we've been going through the book of Acts looking at miracle after miracle. Have you got some time to look at some things tonight? Miracle after miracle after miracle. Can I remind you of a few of them and, and talk about it? We, the book of Acts, if you hadn't read it or if you hadn't read it recently, man, do it. Get in there. Read it. and Because you and I are a part of the very same church that you read about in the book of Acts. People talk about the early church. Well, it's the church that was in the earth before us, but it's not a different church. We're part of the same church. We got exactly the same message to preach that they preached. We got the same Holy Spirit, same name of Jesus, right? They experienced supernatural events, didn't they? The book of Acts begins by Jesus having been resurrected, them looking at him and him going up out of their sight, up out of the, off the ground, 
and in, out of sight into, into the clouds. And angels saying, just like you saw him leave, he's coming back. <laughs> you believe it happened just like that. And then he told them, he said, uh, you, you tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. So in Acts 2, they're all waiting in the upper room seeking God and praying. And there came a rushing sound, a sound like a rushing mighty wind, like a storm wind blowing inside the house. And then fire is burning and they saw it. And this wind is blowing and the fire is burning. Supernatural. Somebody say supernatural. Do you believe this? If you believe the Bible, you have to believe this. And this fire came down and sat on them. And it didn't burn them. And it didn't hurt them. It filled them. They were filled to overflowing and begin to speak profusely in languages they never learned. And it made them act like drunk people. <laughs> it did. Because when they all come tumbling out of that upper room, down the stairs and into the streets, and the people that saw them thought, what is this? I mean, it, this did not go unnoticed. It, it shook the whole area. And people were visiting from countries all around that spoke all these different dialects and languages and they heard them in all these different languages and they knew these people were not from their country and had no way of knowing their language and they said, how are we hearing them? They're talking our language and we know they don't know it. It was a sign. I said it was a sign. Glory to God. Then Peter and John went up to the gate called Beautiful and there was a man that they laid there every day to beg. Never had taken a step. He's a grown man, but he was born with something wrong in, in his feet and his ankles. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up, get up and walk. And they grabbed him and they lifted up and he jumped and leaped and walked, and they all ran together in the temple. And everybody in town knew this guy. He sat there every day begging for money. And I mean, the town was just stirred to the core. Somebody say, miracle, miracle, miracle. Well, it made the leaders mad. They arrested them. They beat them. For what? A man gets healed. See, the devil was in that, wasn't he? And notice what he told them, what they, what they charged them. You cannot preach or teach anymore in this Jesus name. <laughs> and when they finally let them go, they all went back and they all gathered up together. And they said, Lord, you heard them. You heard all that threatening to us. And what we're saying is, Lord, let your hand be on us strong. Let your anointing and boldness be on us. Stretch forth your hand to heal. We want some more of these healings. Yes. Give us some more of these miracles yes. and help us to preach like a house of fire. Yes. We're not hiding. We're going to preach in the name of Jesus. Yes. We're going to teach. Yes. We're not backing off. And the house began to shake. Yes. And it was not from natural phenomena. It was no earthquake. It was no storm outside. God shook that house. Do you believe it? Yes. And I mean, cloths were taken from the body of Paul and when they touched the sick or oppressed, they were healed and delivered and set free. Many were healed that were lame and, and, and uh, delivered and many were filled with the Spirit and whole cities turned to the Lord. Have you read the book of Acts? The uh, Paul spoke and that spirit left that damsel that was uh, divining and fortune telling and all that kind of thing and, and uh, there were judgment miracles Herod got up and, and, and defied God and he was trying to kill the saints of God and the angel struck him and 
he died. And Elamus, you know, the sorcerer was, was trying to get in Paul's face and keep him from preaching to the man that was over the country. And he spoke to him and the hand of God came on him and they had to lead him away. Miracles. Somebody say miracles. miracles. We know from the, from the Exodus how God used signs and wonders in Moses and Aaron. And amazing things happened in that whole nation. Well, God has not changed. I said, God has not changed. And when you talk about these things as we have, sometimes people say, well, if that's all true, why don't we see more of it? Why, why isn't more of it happening? Why don't we see it if it's true? Well, some people are seeing some things. But that attitude is one of the reasons why more don't. Because it's show me and I'll believe. If, if, if I see something, if I could see some, show me some of the miracles. Show me some of that and I'll believe. That is not how it works. Seeing is not believing. The way it works is you believe and then you see. If you say, show me, and then I believe, you can go your whole life and just be on the outside looking in. Things will be happening around you, but you won't perceive them. Because God has ordained that we walk by faith, and without faith it's impossible to please Him. God could shake this planet. I mean, he could do in just a few seconds, shake this planet where there wouldn't be anybody of any religion or any age or any culture on the planet would doubt that he's real and he's there. Why didn't he do it? He has chosen not to do it. He's called a God who hides himself as well as a God who reveals himself. Why? He reveals himself to those that believe in him. And this is the proving time, these generations. There's coming a time when it's going to be over. And those who believed in him will be counted worthy to live with him and rule and reign with him. Those who would not believe in him will be separated from him. Aren't you glad you're able to believe in him tonight? Oh, thank you, Lord. But before we see him come, clouds of glory and, and power, and he shakes the earth, and uh, there's no, nobody around could doubt because they're going to see him. You and I can walk by faith right now, and we can experience miraculous things like the book of Acts experienced. Because even though we walk by faith, it doesn't mean we never have any experiences in Him. We don't say, well, I have to see it, then I'm going to believe it. No, we say, we believe it. And then as we walk with Him, we'll see some things. Can we talk tonight about our part? What we must do to see more and experience more of the miraculous? Are, are you with me this evening? Uh, go over to 1 Corinthians, please. Thank you, Lord. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. In 1 Corinthians 12, let me read uh, some of this passage because this is the spirit of what we've been on for weeks now is in this passage. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. He said, now concerning spiritual, now the word gifts is added by the translators, that means it's not there in the original. 
It just literally is spirituals, things of and pertaining to the Holy Spirit. Would that include miracles, moving and manifestations of the Spirit? He said, concerning those things, I would not have you ignorant. So ignorance is obviously an issue, isn't it? Why don't we see more of these things? Why haven't we had more of these things? Here's one reason. Ignorance. Ignorance. Ignorance just means you don't know. You're not aware of. You don't know about. And there's people that, you know, hold churches and, and groups that have gone generation after generation and they never expect any miracles. And they, they don't believe in them in that regard. In fact, if anything started to happen, they'd shut it down. Yeah. <laughs> They're scared of it. And so many times what people are ignorant of, what they don't know about, they're scared of. And if you, something begins to happen that's new to you and you don't know about, and you shut it down, well, things can be prevented before they ever get going. And God's not going to force anything on us. If people don't want it, He's not going to push it off on you. So that's one reason why we've been teaching on it. While we've been talking about it, we're reminding ourselves that this book is full of miracles. And the book of Acts, their lifestyle was one that they encountered the miraculous on a regular basis, didn't they? I mean, they saw things. They heard things. Things happened. Rushing winds. Flames of fire. <laughs> Anybody excited about this at all? Do you believe in it? He said, I don't want you to be ignorant about these things. He said, you know, you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Or ghost is an old English word for spirit. By the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? We've, we've touched on this already. The purpose of miracles, it is not for us to seek something so we can have some kind of a supernatural ability to go do great things for God. That is erroneous thinking. That's incorrect thinking. And yet that's the way many have thought and that's a common mistake that young people make. I'm talking about spiritually young. If you do believe in the miraculous, then they seek, they want experiences and they want, I, I want power so that I can do this and I can know this and I can see this. Can you see a, a problem? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, not, it's not about you. No. <laughs> it's not about us getting something. And pe many have read this chapter and it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And, and they think about, well, I, I need those gifts and I, I'm going to get me some of them gifts so I can, I can be a spiritual powerhouse and so I can go do great things for God. Wrong, 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 wrong. You can of yourself do nothing. It's not about you getting something that's amazing and miraculous so you can go do something with it. It's about you and I getting to a place where God could use us where he could manifest through us as he wills. And you see that emphasized in this very, the very next verses. Keep reading. He said, there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same spirit. There are differences of administrations, or you could say ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which works all in all. God works in, a, in many different ways and you and I and nobody is ever going to know them all. And he is not limited to moving in the ways, only the ways we read about in the book of Acts. You need to remember when these things were happening in their life, what point of reference did they have to go back to? 
You see some similar things. You see some principles of things in the Old Testament. But the Spirit of God, He can move in so many ways. And we should not be shocked that something begins to happen that we've not experienced before. And famous last words of dying churches are, we've never done it like that before. We've never seen it like that before. Well, no, we want to be open, not just open to anything, and not just open to anything that's spiritual, not just open to anything that's miraculous, but open to anything that is the Holy Spirit. And he's telling us how you can know it's the Holy Spirit. He says if somebody is saying something about Jesus being a curse, something disrespectful and, and blasphemous about him, he said that's not the Holy Spirit. But nobody who's speaking, this is not just somebody saying something off the top of their head. They're prophesying something uh, spiritual is happening, but they're speaking of the Lordship of Jesus. He, that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit manifesting in the miraculous is going to glorify not me, not you, not a denomination, not this church, Jesus. Come on, are y'all with me? He's going to glorify your and my master. And he can do that through healings, through deliverances through signs and wonders and mighty deeds. It is the will of God for Jesus to be glorified in this earth. For everybody to find out about him. And everybody to see how powerful he is and how good he is. And how kind and what love and compassion. And I, when I think about that, I, Remember years ago, it's been 20 years ago or so, a great big guy who had lived such a rough outlaw life. We're in a meeting, the Spirit of God began to move. And uh, I look back and he had looked so hard, you know, like he didn't even want to be in the meeting. Somebody made him come or something. But at, at the end of the service, tears, big old crocodile tears are rolling down his face. And, and he's standing there shaking and, and, uh, and, uh, let me just stop right here. How many understand all the talk and reasoning and mental stuff in the world cannot reach a man like that? All the carefully crafted doctrinal articles can never break through a hard shell like that. But I, I wanted to talk to him. I knew God had done something to him. And I, I came to him and I said, Brother, I said, God's done something for you. And he just, he started to talk and he just cried. Big old, big old rough looking guy. And, and he said, why would he do it? Why would he do it? I said, what'd he do? He said, why would he heal me? I've been mean as a devil. He said, why would he heal me? He healed me. I said, he loves you. He just went, oh, and he cried. <laughs> That's miraculous. Something he had had treatment for and had procedures for and couldn't get fixed. And God healed him in a moment of time, came in. And the thing that impressed him the most was how could God love him? So such a hard, mean guy that he had been. And, and that's all I need to tell him. He said, why would he do it? And I said, he loves you. He loves you. He cried. He said, well, I want him. And gave his heart to the Lord. Gave his life to the Lord. Somebody say glory to God. How many people have talked about, well, you know, they needed those miraculous things in the beginning days of the church you know, to confirm the word and to establish the church. The church doesn't need established today. People don't need to know the power of God today. Certainly they do. Nothing has changed. Our talking is not enough. 
We need demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now, it does come in line with the Word, preaching and teaching of the Word, but it's not just dead, dry, empty talk. It is proclamation and it is demonstration. How many know we ought to proclaim the Word, we ought to teach and preach the Word, and then next Sunday there's testimonies. Yes. Testimonies. Yes. Testimonies. Somebody got healed. Somebody got set free. Somebody got saved. Somebody got back to God. Somebody got delivered. Somebody got filled. Yes. And the Lord has done that for us. Yes. Hasn't he? Yes. We're seeing it yes. on a regular basis, but we're not seeing all that we can see oh, yeah. by any stretch. Yeah. And why would the Lord have us talking about this? Because yeah. he's waiting on us to bring us to the next place and level of his uh, manifestation. But we need to get in agreement. And we need to not be ignorant of these things. We need to be aware of these things. And we need to believe these things. Keep reading. He said, uh, verse uh, 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now this is miraculous. This is, this is not natural. This is supernatural. The word of wisdom is a manifestation of the plan and purposes of God. It has to do with the future. Isn't this one of the greatest things you could know? It's about the plan of God and about the direction and about the future. Didn't the scripture say he will show us? things to come. This is not something you can figure out. It's not, this is not wisdom you can get from going to, to school and getting degrees and, and reading books. No, 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 no. All of these things are supernatural. And to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. The Spirit of God who lives in us knows everything. He knows everything about everything. And he's not going to tell you everything. It would, uh, we don't need to know all of that. But there are things we need to know. And he can cause you to know things that you did not hear, you did not learn, nobody told you. There's no natural way you could know it. But you just know it. Supernatural. Keep reading, verse 9. To another faith by the same Spirit. Now there is a faith that comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And that's how we live. But God is the God of faith. And there's a lot about faith we haven't found out. And we don't know the, how high it is and how big it is. But there are times that God, uh, Brother Smith Wigglesworth said it like this in his writings, that there are times when you can press and, and, and use all the faith you've got and it just seems like there's no way. And he said there's another faith that comes down and takes hold of you. And, and with that, nothing's impossible. You believe it can be done. Come on, are you listening, saints? God uh, can, can minister to you and come up inside you. And my, I'm telling you, though it might seem like it's impossible, you'll just rise up and feel like you're 25 feet tall. And you'll just look across it and just, and just dare it not to happen. Anybody know what I'm talking about or not? He said, and to another, the gifts of healing. That doesn't mean you can heal people, but it means that God manifests uh, specific things in areas. And that's why sometimes you'll see people, uh, they'll have more, more testimonies of healing in this area than in other areas. And it's because God is ministering some things just to help. Anybody can be healed of anything by faith. But God wants us healed so much that he, he gives us all these other things to help us. And sometimes when you see by word of knowledge things called out, you've seen it in, in the ministry here. Uh, sometimes it'll, it might be something in the neck or, or something in the liver or a kidney. Well, that's not just, the Lord's not just informing us that something is happening. He's ministering gifts of healing in that area at that time. He's ministering to people in a special way. And in an environment like that, it's very easy to believe. And very easy to receive. Keep, keep reading verse 10. To another what? The working of miracles. Working of miracles. Working. 
usually involves something. Like Moses had a staff. Like the prophet threw meal into the, the stew. Uh, the, the man of God said, throw a stick in the uh, water and, uh, and the iron head will swim to it. Something, something that the Lord tells you to do. He told, Jesus told them, go get the water uh, buckets and, and fill that thing up. And see, there was something that they did that worked in, in it, but then as they did it, a miracle happened. Somebody say, work in the miracles. To another prophecy that's speaking by inspiration in, in a language that you know. To another, discerning the spirits. To another, divers kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Is this describing a miraculous way of living? It is. This is not just living out of your head. This is not just living by your brawn or by your wits. This is not just living like unsaved people. This is living a supernatural life. A spiritual life. Now, it might not always be obvious to other people around about you, but you can be on your job. You not make a, a sound or draw any attention to yourself and you can just stop and check in your heart and the Holy Ghost just calls you to know something. That there's no way you could have known this. Now when he does, don't go around and brag about it. And when people look at you and they're impressed with you and they go, man, you're smart. How did you know that? How did you know to do that? You need to look back and go, I didn't. Well, yeah, you did. Mm -mm, I didn't. He showed me. He gave it to me. I didn't figure it out. I didn't know what to do. That is, if you want it to happen again. <laughs> now, if you don't want it to happen again, just take credit for it. Just rear back in your seat and go, yeah, you know you have to watch. And pay close attention and, and I'm a thinker. You got to stay on your toes. <laughs> yeah, and you will be on your own. How many don't want to be on your own? I don't know, no, no. How many would acknowledge I need his help? I need Every hour of every day, I am not enough by myself. I don't know enough. I'm not enough. But thank God I'm not by myself. He's in me. He's with me all the time. Thank you, Lord. And as we learn to look to him and yield to him, he will show us things to come. He'll show us what's coming up and how this thing's going to play out. And he'll, he'll give us a, a glimpse. Now, not a, not a, a book not even a paragraph, a word. A word is just a fragment. Why? Because if he showed you the whole thing, you wouldn't be walking by as much faith. And it's the faith that pleases him. So he'll just give us a glimpse, and that's enough for us to know the right direction and, and enough for us to know the right thing to say and maybe the, the thing not to do. And if we'll just take that step, as we walk in the light, more light will come. But we're living and operating supernaturally, spiritually, not just naturally. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, so be it. He said, but all these worketh that one in the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. And he goes on talking about the body of Christ, which we are. And these are the abilities that, of the spirit that function through the body of Christ, which we are. And skip on down to verse uh, 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Or uh, other translations say the greatest gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And he starts talking about love. And walking in the God kind of love. But I'm getting to a second thing that has to do with us seeing more of the miraculous. What was the first one? Ignorance. Ignorance is a problem. People are not aware of it. They don't think about it. They don't look for it. They don't understand it. They're not open to it. But then also, this is a big one here. What did he say to do? Covet. Earnestly. Somebody say covet. covet. Earnestly. 
He's talking about these, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Isn't that the miraculous? Isn't that the, the manifestations of, of the Spirit of God? The working of miracles? The gifts of healings? This, everybody awake now. This is one of the biggest areas where we've fallen short. The truth is, most folks just don't want it enough. Just, not, just don't desire it enough. Not hungry enough for it. That's us. That's this church. And that's every other church. Do you understand it must be important to desire it or he wouldn't tell you specifically and use this kind of terminology. He didn't just say desire it. What did he say? Covet. And what else? Earnestly. And in the Greek, these words are strong as you can make them. What does that mean? You have a consuming, continuous hunger and a desire for these things. And does that describe most churches? It does not at all. Most churches, ignorant of all of this, don't think about it. So how are you going to be earnestly coveting? And you're not even aware. Never talk about it. I mean, there are churches all over this country and world that in the last three generations, they've never heard any teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. None. They talk about don't lie, don't steal, be nice, act pretty, <laughs> be good, quit sinning. And that's all great. But I'm answering the question, why don't we see these things? Are y'all with me, saints? Why don't we see what we read about in the book of Acts? Now, life is short. And the Lord taught me how to do this years ago, and we're doing it right now. We are not going to make excuses, and we're not going to water down the Bible to fit our lack of experience. Amen. Come on, saints. You, you feel the same way? We Come on, I want you to read this book of Acts, and I want you to read it again, and I want you to read it again, and I want you to read it again, and as you read it, you will realize I've never experienced that. I've never been in that kind of service. I've never experienced that. I've never seen that. I've never heard that. I've never felt that. And so then it's time. Well, what about it? Why haven't I? And you can make excuses. Well, this and well, that and differences in the times are different and people are different. No, they're not. No. Just because they got some technology doesn't mean humans are different. Devils are different. And God's not different. No, no, no. What you got to do is you got to say, Lord, I want this. Come on, saints, are y'all with me or not? Lord, I want this. I elevate my life, elevate our experience, elevate our church so that we live like this. So that what we're reading about in here. We're experiencing yes. in our daily life. Yes. Do you believe it's for us? Yes. God, God has, people change, not God. Right. People have gotten cold and intellectual and, and gotten away and, and forgotten about. And I mean, people, you can do this for generations. But God is exactly the same God that you read about in the book of Acts. And His will is the same. And the message is the same. And the Holy Spirit is the same. And the name of Jesus is the same. The same. The same. We ought not be seeing less. We ought to be seeing more. This is the church generations down the road. We ought to be picking up steam. We ought to be gaining momentum. Not trying to get back to where they started. And yet that's where we are. But you won't, you won't experience more by uh, making excuses. How do you pray, Lord? I see it. I believe it. I believe I'm reading what actually happened. 
and I believe I'm reading the will of God. You had this recorded so we would know how to live, so we would know how to operate. This is a blueprint. This is for the church. And I'm saying, Lord, elevate my experience to, to meet this. Raise me up. Raise my life, whatever it takes, my, my, my understanding, my, my grasp, my, my, my faith, my ability to respond to you. Raise me up. Raise us up to where we're living just like that. We're experiencing the same things and even more. Now let's talk about this some more. It, well, uh, put this scripture up for us, please, on the screen. Isaiah. Let's see. Isaiah 26 is what it is. What did he say? Covet earnestly. Covet what earnestly? Working the miracles, gifts of healings, special faith, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Now, when I say that, that doesn't even mean anything to a lot of people. Folks are like, hmm, yeah, whatever that is. So that's back to the first part, ignorance, isn't it? We're answering the question, why don't we see more of this? Why aren't we seeing it? This is why. One is ignorance. And two is lack of desire. Just don't want it. Want something else more. Uh... In Isaiah, what did we say, 26? I believe it's verse 9. Put verse 9 up there. I want you to notice connection. The Spirit of God said through the prophet, With my soul have I desired you in the night. Look what happens as a result of that desire. And with my spirit within me will I seek you early. Desire compels you to seek. If you want something, you look for it. <laughs> Are people in the church looking for the Spirit of God and His moving and His manifestations? Are they looking for the word of knowledge and, and the word of wisdom and the work of the miracles, are they? No, they're not. They're looking for how to make more money. Looking for how to have a more comfortable life and comfortable retirement. And, and looking for, how can you tell? Whatever you're seeking after, that's what you desire. That's what you really want. Matthew 7, let's look there. You know it, but let's remind ourselves. This is not, well, I, maybe I just not say that. <laughs> uh, Matthew 7, are you there? Seven and seven. What does it say? Ask. Huh? Ask. Ask. What will happen? It will be given to you. What else? Seek. Seek. And what will happen? Jesus is talking. These are his words. He said ask. So if you do what he told you to do, what will you do? You'll ask. With confidence 
Hmm? That what you're asking about will be given to you. Why would you, why would you think that that would happen? Because Jesus, my master, told me it would. He told me to ask, and he told me what would happen when I asked. And I believe him. Well, you just never know. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. See, that's religion. That's men's tradition replacing the Word of God. Well, you just never know. No. Ask. Jesus said it shall be given you. Seek. And you shall find. Knock. It shall be open to you. Keep reading. For everyone. Yeah, but now does that really, really mean, you need to, watch what you're saying, this, Jesus said this. You're going to take apart what he said? You're going to try to water down what he said? Let's just leave what he said as what he said. And believe it. And rejoice over it. And be so excited about it that we get to asking and seeking and knocking, confident that everyone that asks receives. And he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be open. This is the failure of the church. People are not asking. They're not seeking. They're not knocking. You, you heard sometimes people say, well, you know, before every great revival, before every great move of God, there was prayer. And that's true. But there was something before there was prayer. You know what it was? Desire. Why do people roll out of bed at 2 in the morning and pray for three hours when they could be snoozing? Why? Why do people show up and go to church every night for a month and when they could be doing Why do people? Come on, can you see this, friends? When you get to hungering and you get to desiring, it will put you in seeking mode. It will compel you. It will impel you to pray and to seek God and to look for it and to hunger for it. And when you get a house full of people, come on now, you get a house full of people hungry and seeking and praying at home for what? Not for a bunch of dead religion. What are we hungry for? We're hungry for the moving of the Spirit. We're hungry for gifts of healings and, and working of miracles and, and the Spirit of God speaking and doing and moving. We don't want a show. We don't want somebody to see us. We want God to show up. We want God to show up and move and people to see Him and know that He's real and know how good He is and needs met right and left and front and back and all over the place. And ever how God would do that is not for us to tell him. It might be a flame of fire. It might be a rushing mighty, mighty wind. It might be something totally different. Whatever it is, it'll be good. Yes. It'll be wonderful. But our part is to desire. Somebody say desire. desire. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You see that scripture in, in Isaiah. He said, I, 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 I longed for him. I desired him in the night. And what did that produce? In the morning early, he was seeking him. Why? The desire compelled the seeking. What's the good thing about seeking the Lord? You're going to find something. <laughs> On the day of Pentecost, wasn't that exactly what they were doing? What were they doing up there in the upper room? They weren't having committee meetings. <laughs> they weren't debating doctrinal points. What were they doing? They, they were seeking the Lord. One mind, 
One accord. He said, you go, you go and you, you wait. What are they waiting on? They're not just waiting passively to see if anything might happen. The Lord told them. So they know it will. So they're waiting in anticipation, in expectation. And they're seeking God and they just stayed there. And glory to God. <laughs> I don't know how long they had been doing that. How many days? How long? But in the midst of it, you know, you, you get to seeking him and you get to hungry enough for him, you quit watching the clock. Amen. You quit watching the clock and, and you, you arrange your schedule to where you don't have to be anywhere else and, and you don't have to do anything else at that time and you do what you can to, to just give yourself to that. And they had done that for enough time till they got used to that. And then, glory to God, while they're seeking him, here he was. They sought and they found. Why don't people have things? They, they don't want them enough. They don't desire them enough. Uh, I got about 15 extra pounds <laughs> I don't need. <laughs> uh, why am I not already got that off? I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. <laughs> why, don't I, why am I not already trimmer, feeling better, and wearing smaller pants? Why don't I already have that? Huh? Now see, people make all kind of excuses. My metabolism and my lifestyle and da 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 da. And no, uh uh. Well, you know, I have to travel so much and people are always trying to feed me all this rich food and, and uh, no, that ain't why. That's not why. Do you know why? Yeah. I know why. I'm not deceived. It's because I haven't wanted it enough. If I want it enough, I'll do what it takes to get it. And if I keep deciding that it Midnight, I want a big sandwich and Doritos and, <laughs> and a milkshake and a candy bar. And, <laughs> then what do I want more? I want the milkshake. I'm not saying you can't ever have a milkshake, but if you want to lose 15 pounds, you got to do something. Somewhere. Sometime. Well, what's the truth? The truth is, I want that more than I wanted that. That's the truth. That's just what it is. People don't like it that black and white. They don't like it that cut and dry. And they're like, mm. <laughs> Then you'll never reach the thing that you say you want. Because there will always be an excuse as to why you can't. Why don't we have more of the move of God like we read about in the book of Acts for the very same reason. We just haven't wanted it enough. People would like to have it if it would just come fall on them. <laughs> but if I'm going to have to do something if, if I'm going to have to change my lifestyle, if I'm going to have to come to a whole other level of commitment, if I'm going to have to quit doing this and start doing this, then it comes down to folks just, they don't want it enough to do that. That is the truth. Yeah. <laughs> 
But the good news is we're still alive. We still have some time. God's still on the throne. Hmm? And uh, we can get hungry. Talking about, people say, you're talking about a New Year's resolution? Uh-uh, no. No, this has always been this way. And God doesn't change. And just because a calendar page turned and he doesn't change. We need to be honest with ourselves. He would have already done a lot of things in previous years if we had wanted it enough. So let's open our hearts up to him and let's allow him to show us what we could be having, <laughs> what we could be a part of. And let's see if we're willing to pay a price yes. to have it. If we're willing to make some changes and to cut some things off and to sacrifice some things and change some things. If it's worth the price. I believe it is. Yes. Do you? Yes. I believe it is. Now see the devil will try to tell you, oh man, if you really just go all out for God... Well, you won't get to do this, and you won't get to do that. Man, you just won't have any fun. You won't be enjoying life. That is a lie. That is a lie. Trying to satisfy spiritual desire with natural stuff is frustrating, and it does not satisfy. And no matter how many cars you get and how much food you eat and how much new clothes you get, it will never satisfy what's really on the inside of you. You know what you want? More than anything, whether you'll acknowledge it or not, you want to experience God. You want to experience, come on, the one who made you. Deep is calling unto deep from the inside of you to him. And oh, friend, I, a lot I haven't experienced, most I haven't experienced, but I have experienced a few things. And I'm telling you the glory of God. It's amazing that we can slip back into the natural and, 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 and be dulled to it and let it go. Because I, some of the times I've had the greatest experiences in God, I started out by repenting. Thinking, God, I knew this. I could have been having this. Already, and yet, what am I doing? I'm being carnal, living a carnal life. The flesh will hold us out if we'll let it. And we can look back in the history books and we can read in the book of Acts and say, mm mm, wouldn't that have been something? Or, 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 in the next few days, weeks, and months, your life can change, and mine can change, and we can let the fire of God burn in us, not just when we're at church, but when we're at home laying on our bed, get to praying in the Spirit. And just get to praying and get to praying and get to praying and get to praying and realize, man, I've been praying for two hours. It seemed like ten minutes. And what you're doing is yielding. And that's the third thing. We let the Lord teach us. We learn about these things and we hunger for them. And we desire them. And in that, involved in that is the asking and of course you've got to ask in faith. So we're believing in these things and we're believing for these things and we're expecting them. And as sure as we do, as sure as we do, as surely as we do, they'll begin to happen more. Now when they do, I didn't say if, when they do, the next part is very, very important. We must yield. Because if we don't yield, we'll stop it. He said, 
Going down in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he talks about the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit are for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. And he, he finished up by saying, emphasizing prophecy, but he said, don't forbid to speak in tongues. What would that be? That would be shutting it down. You're not going to have that. You're not going to yield to that. Now, my job, our job as leaders is to discern in the service what should be yielded to and what shouldn't be. And uh, sometimes people, they sense the Spirit of God and they want to do something, but they don't realize it's just for them. It's not for the congregation. And it's not the right way to do it. And I don't pretend that I know all about this. I'm, I need to learn a ton. But... One thing we would have as leaders and any head of any church would have, you have an anointing the Lord would give you to discern because that's part of the job, isn't it? And so if things begin to happen and things begin to move and I say or one of the others that are leading say, no, no, hold that. Don't do that right now. Hold that. Don't get upset. Don't get mad. We're all learning. Right? Right? But the Bible says everything needs to be done how? Decently, properly, in order. And so uh, uh, there, there must be respect for the Holy Spirit and respect for the leadership. Amen. And uh, if I make a mistake, I'll admit it. I'll come back and say, hey, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I should have let this go this way. or I, I, I've done it before. I'll do it again. I know I don't know everything. But the Lord has impressed me not to let things be taken away from me and out of my hands. Did you hear me? He has impressed this upon me repeatedly. And uh, it's a responsibility I have. And that's not always easy. I've been in situations in the past where People wanted to do this and that, and they wanted to take the service a different way, and sometimes it's not easy. Telling folks no. But uh, if I'm answerable for a mistake, I'd rather it be my mistake than yours. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if you understand that or not. Yes. <laughs> the Lord told me the, the first week this church was starting, the first week. He said, son, if you're always giving in to people, who's leading this place? You're always giving people, I want to do this, so you say, fine, do it. Yeah, I want to do this, well, fine, do it. If you're always giving in to people, who's leading this? Well, it wouldn't be me, it's whoever I'm giving in to. He said, if I'd have wanted them over it, I'd have put them over it. So we don't want to be so tight that we won't yield to anything, but then we don't want to yield to just anything that's wrong either. Just because something is spiritual don't mean it's God. Just because somebody feels like they got something don't mean it's right. Or maybe it's right, but it's not right to give out then, or it's not for the whole crowd, it's just for them. And Who's going to discern that? Well, that's our job. And uh, I would appreciate you praying for us. Yeah. We've had, we have some experience in this. Not enough, but some. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> What's the first part? Do we want it? Right. Do we want it enough to seek God? Not just two or three people in the church, but it just spread through the whole church. And people are praying at home. And they're seeking God at home. And they're hungering. And they're thirsting for the things of God. Can you say so be it? Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet, everybody. 
We hope you enjoyed this message from Pastor Keith Moore, from Faith Life Church, in Branson, Missouri. We're working on getting this lesson formatted, and ready for translation, into many languages. One of our goals, is to curate and duplicate, the best teaching in the world. There are millions of sermons and lessons online, and many that are great, but not effectively managed. Most of the time, they are disorganized and unfiltered. It is very confusing, for a new believer, to find in-depth quality teaching, that will lay a strong faith foundation. Visit faithtrainers.com, forward slash, eagle team to learn more. Grow fast. Grow strong. Glorify God.